Hi, I'm Marty McCaffrey with the Divers Alert Network. It may seem a little bit hard to believe, but 40% of all the communication we have with divers, be it email, information calls, and even the emergency line, that 40% of the communications has to do with ear and sinus issues. Now, certainly equalizing ears and sinuses is something those of us that can do it easily pretty much take for granted. But apparently, there's still some trouble that students are having or regular divers are having. There are things that we, as dive educators, can do to help these folks. And when I say we, it's not the royal we. It includes me, because I, too, am an instructor, and, too, I speak to a lot of divers. But there are tools that we can use as professionals to help students do a better job. And there's things that will help us do our job better. Some of the tools that we're going to talk about is one, it's important to have a good understanding of ear anatomy. Take some of the mystery out of it. It's not as complicated as you might think, and we'll talk more about that. I'm going to stick mostly to the common injuries. There are many different types of injuries that can occur with the ears and sinuses, but the most common ones are what occupy the greatest amount of time and concern with divers. It's important to know the typical signs and symptoms of those common injuries. And what are the things that make it difficult for people to equalize? There are some very common things that they encounter that can be corrected or at least helped. There are also simply mechanical things that we can do to help our students that don't involve medication or surgery, just very simple mechanical things we can do that we're gonna talk about. And we're going to have a very frank and honest discussion about medications and how they should be properly used. And two, we're going to talk about what you can do if somebody does end up with an injury. What can we do in the field to help them out? So let's take a look at the ear anatomy. That's the most important place to start. Now the external ear starts with the earlobe itself, which helps direct sound towards the ear canal, and that leads up, of course, to the eardrum. So that part of the ear that's on the outside, the ear lobe itself, and the ear canal, that's the external ear. And we'll break it down to give you the more of the zones of the ear. What's most important to remember about the ear is it's very much like a vehicle or a boat. You've got a mechanical system, a hydraulic system, and an electrical system. Those are the three systems that are involved in the ear, and we'll talk about all of those symptoms. If you remember how the ear works, we have the sound waves that go through the ear canal, cause the eardrum to vibrate, which pushes the small bones. Now, if you see on the slide, it refers to them by their you know, medical terms, which is the malleus, incus, and stapes. If you can simply remember hammer, anvil, and stirrup, that's gonna start you off way ahead of the game. So as the eardrum vibrates, it pushes against the small bones that tap against the cochlea. And that's that snail-like looking device in the inner ear. That's filled with fluid. So the eardrum, the external ear, and the bones of the ear are the mechanical system. That stirrup taps against that cochlea. Now, underneath the stirrup is what's known as the oval window. And you can see below the stirrup, there's also one called the round window. The cochlea and the round and oval windows are part of the inner ear. Everything else from the eardrum and the bones is the middle ear. So the hydraulic system is actually the cochlea. That's filled with fluid. And as the stirrup taps on the oval window, the round window in turn has to bulge out. So that's that hydraulic system, the fluid moving back and forth because of the vibration. Now, if you look at the top of the cochlea, there are structures known as the semicircular canals. These are the tubes that the fluid will actually move through. Lining those canals are little hair-like structures known as cilia. As the fluid moves through those canals and those cilia pick up the movement, that's what helps us in terms of our balance. This is part of our balance mechanism. When we move our head, the fluid moves, and that's what helps us figure out where our head is in three-dimensional space. Now, there are injuries that affect the inner ear, and that's 
obviously a round or oval window rupture, which you will hear about from time to time, or even inner ear or vestibular decompression sickness. Those folks, there is no guesswork involved. These folks are very sick. They have trouble walking. They're having a hard time keeping their balance. A lot of times they're even to the point where they're very nauseated and vomiting. So the symptoms of an inner ear problem are usually pretty obvious and pretty profound. So there's no guesswork there. So we've covered the mechanical and the hydraulic system. Now the electrical system are the nerves that are attached to the cochlea. You've got the auditory nerve, which is what carries the signals to the brain, where the brain interprets things as sound. Plus you have the nerves that are connected to the semicircular canals that help with balance mechanism. One of the key structures, of course, that's problematic for divers and where most of the focus seems to be is the eustachian tube. As you remember, those are the tubes that connect the back of the throat to the middle ear. This is where the air comes from as we push it through the tube to the middle ear to equalize. And this is usually the area that draws most of the concern. But we'll talk more about that as we go along. So let's look again so we make sure there's no confusion about what the parts of the ear are. The external canal you see marked in purple, that's the external ear and the ear canal itself up to the eardrum. The next portion you see highlighted in red, that's the middle ear. That includes the eustachian tube, the eardrum, and the small hammer, anvil, and stirrup that move along with sound waves. So that area is the middle ear. There's a misconception that anything on the inside of the eardrum is the inner ear. No, that's not true. The final portion that you see highlighted in green, which is the nerves and the cochlea, that's the actual inner ear. So remember, that's the part that's the inner ear. Anything else inside there, that's the middle ear space, and that's the area of greatest concern with most dive injuries. I wanted to point out the area inside the nose, that's known as the nasopharynx. If you picture the area above the hard palate in the roof of your mouth, that whole area is much larger than you might think. And you can see it encompasses a pretty good area. And it's important for that to be clear. It also shows you where some of the sinuses are. And if you notice where the little black dots are that point to the sinuses, all the openings to the sinuses are connected to that nasopharynx. And they're not much larger than those black dots. So it doesn't take much in the way of congestion or mucus to block the sinus openings. And this is why, because they're all connected to the nasopharynx, this is why our sinuses equalize the same time our middle ears do. But all these end up being connected in the same place. Since the sinuses are all connected to that nasopharynx, we want to talk about where the sinuses are and where it's likely to create a problem for divers. The most prominent ones, of course, are in the forehead. If you ever had a, a, a cold or sinus infection or even allergies, you're very familiar with that pressure sensation just above the eyebrows. That's the frontal sinuses. The next area where you find the sinuses are behind the cheekbones. Those are known as the maxillary sinuses. This is the maxillary bone across the front of the face. And you will find that's where the maxillary sinuses are. And those are fairly common too with being problematic. Now another set of sinuses are behind the eyes. And these are known as the ethmoid or ethmoidal sinuses. What's important to remember about all the sinuses, and this is something that we humans experience, it's a phenomenon known as referred pain means that an area that's being affected, the nerves can actually register pain in places other than where the actual illness or injury is. For example, I think most people are aware that if you're having left shoulder pain, that can also indicate a heart problem. Or if you've ever had a gallbladder problem, your right shoulder can hurt, and that's referred pain. The frontal sinuses, they can refer pain to the top of the head. So it's not unusual for somebody with a frontal sinus problem to not only have a headache in the forehead, but also have pain at the top of the head. The maxillary sinuses can actually cause pain to radiate into the teeth, and we'll talk a little more about that. The folks that may have a problem with their ethmoid sinuses, 
these are the folks that are going to come up complaining that they have a stabbing pain in their eyes or a lot of pressure behind their eyes. Start thinking that it may be an ethmoid sinus problem. The other sinuses that are below the ethmoid and they're highlighted in yellow, that's the sphenoid sinuses. This too, the sphenoid sinuses can actually cause pain at the very back of the head. So that's that referred pain because it's hard always to detect the sphenoid sinuses, but it can cause some problems at the very back of the head at the base of the skull. There's other things associated with diving that can cause that. But if somebody's complaining about that headache at the very back of the head, think about investigating it being a sinus problem. So it may not be something more serious than that. Another important part of the anatomy to understand is that inside the middle ear, the eustachian tubes, and the sinuses, they're lined with what's known as a mucous membrane. This is the soft tissue that lines all these areas and this is an area that can be kind of problematic and can create problems for divers. What's important to remember is that those mucous membranes are very vasculature, very vascular, meaning they've got a lot of blood vessels, a lot of capillaries. And those smallest blood vessels, the capillaries, can easily fracture or break. The eardrums themselves also have capillaries that supply blood. So with an injury to the eardrum, it can cause bleeding in the eardrum itself or actually to the outside. Those mucous membranes, because they're so vascular, they can be prone to swelling and becoming inflamed, and that can be problematic. And that mucus and inflammation can act like a one-way valve. I know we all teach our students and we've all heard that we should never dive when we've got a head cold or active allergy symptoms. The congestion you get along with a cold can cause a problem with trying to equalize. We know that. It may be blocked. But the thing to keep in mind is that equalization during descent is an active process. We have to do something. Even if it's as simple as swallowing, we have to do something in order for that to happen. So we can actually push air through that mucus or congestion into the middle ear or the sinuses. The problem is that as we're ascending, now that air that we've added at depth has to be able to vent. And that's a passive process. We don't normally have to do anything for that to happen. But that congestion that we were able to push past during descent now is going to act to block the air trying to vent. That's what can set us up for a reverse block. So that's again why it's important not to dive if you've got congestion or mucus. And the cranial nerves that run through the face, these are what provides our ability to move our facial muscles. They also detect pain. And this is another way of explaining that referred pain. 99% of the time, the folks that complain about what they think is a tooth squeeze in their upper tooth, most often is due to a sinus squeeze. If you look at the picture, you'll see that the nerves that run through the maxillary sinus feed down into the teeth. This is why when there's a maxillary sinus squeeze, it can cause pain into the tooth. It also can cause numbness to the face, the cheek, gum, lip. That's another sign that it's probably a sinus squeeze. A tooth that's causing pain won't cause that kind of numbness in the cheek, gum, or lip. Tooth's not going to do that. It's the sinus pressure or pain that's likely to cause that kind of numbness. So remember how these nerves run and how it can refer pain to other areas. We all know that we have to equalize as the pressure increases on the external ear and it's a relatively greater pressure than what we have in the middle ear. And that relative pressure difference, now that means relative to the in outside to the inside, so it's not an absolute number. But a pressure difference of 4.5 PSI to 10 PSI is usually enough to cause the eardrum to rupture. Some people will have their eardrum rupture at the lower end of the scale. Some it's not until you get to the higher end of the scale. But the fact remains that within that range, almost everybody can experience their eardrum rupturing. So it isn't a huge pressure difference. 
As a reminder, one foot of fresh water, which is most likely where people start off, is in the pool. It's 0.433 PSI, and one foot of seawater is 0.445 PSI. And that's a little reminder that you've got almost a half PSI for every foot that you descend. And again, remind everybody equalization during descent is active. We have to do something to add air to the middle ear and the sinuses. During ascent, that equalization is passive. Normally, we don't have to do anything. So the most common ear injuries, of course, is middle ear barotrauma. Baro meaning pressure, injury meaning trauma meaning injury. So it's pressure injury. That's all barotrauma means. And again, it's caused by that relative negative pressure in the middle ear. If we can't match the increase in pressure, that's what's going to cause the injury. That will tend to cause fluid and blood to be drawn from the soft tissue in the middle ear and the eustachian tubes, and it'll cause them to collapse and begin to swell. So that's what's going on with a middle ear squeeze. With the reverse block, again, it's the pain on ascent. And the most common cause of a reverse block is somebody who had middle ear barotrauma during their descent. So having a lot of trouble equalizing during descent can be the most likely thing to set you up for a reverse block. And the sinuses, you can have pain or pressure in either ascent or descent. Now it's a little trickier with the sinuses because these are solid cavities within the bone. So there's nothing flexible like the eardrum to be concerned with. But you do have, again, all that vascular mucous membranes lining the sinuses and there's a lot of pressure that you can feel. So the key is being able to equalize that, but you can have squeeze or barotrauma to the sinuses as easily as the middle ear. So here's what's happening mechanically. Let's look at a common dive, especially in a pool. At four feet of fresh water in the pool, the PSI is increased to 1.73 PSI. That's just at four feet. We already know that that threshold is a relative pressure difference of 4.5 PSI. So here at just four feet, the eardrums, the oval and round windows begin to bulge inward. You get fluid and mucus that starts to fill the eustachian tubes. And you'll have divers from time to time report that they are hearing this high pitched squeak as they're trying to equalize. If you've ever taken a toy balloon and not tied it, and let the air out of it, and you stretch the opening of the balloon, what happens? It makes that horrible squeaking noise. I know it drives our dog crazy. But you're doing the same thing with the eustachian tube. If people are hearing a high-pitched squeak, that means the eustachian tubes are flattening out. So it's much like stretching that balloon to where it's squeaking past it. So if they're hearing that, they're already having a trouble. The capillaries and the nerves begin to stretch in the eardrum and the other mucous membranes. It's starting to cause discomfort and it's straining the blood vessels. At 8 feet, the pressure is increased to 3.46 PSI. And remember the threshold again, bottom most is 4.5. So now you've got blood and mucus actually filling the middle ear space. The eustachian tube at this point is forcibly shut. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to try and equalize at this point. The sinuses are beginning to fill with blood. Divers will report that if they don't reascend, they just stay at depth and they've got sinus pain, they'll notice that it starts to resolve. The reason it's resolving is that you've got blood that's filling up the sinuses and taking up that air space. So it's being replaced by blood. It's not that it's equalizing because of air, it's because you've now got blood filling up that space. So the typical signs and symptoms, the mild symptoms for middle ear barotrauma is most divers will complain of this fullness in their ear, like it's muffled hearing or they feel like they've got water in their ear. Please understand when they're complaining that they feel like they have water in their ear, it's not in the outside ear canal. It's actually in the middle ear on the inside of the eardrum. They really do probably have water in their ear, but it's not in the ear canal. They can feel dizzy or lightheaded, 
and tinnitus is ringing in the ears. Now I want to make a very clear distinction between dizziness, lightheadedness, and true vertigo. True vertigo is that spinning sensation where either you feel like you're spinning or everything around you is spinning. That's vertigo. Dizziness and lightheadedness do not produce that kind of spinning sensation. The levels of discomfort, of course, will vary with everybody's own personal pain tolerance and how severe the injury is. Divers will mention, too, that they have this popping or crackling noise in their middle ear when they swallow, chew, those kind of activities. Our ears, the middle ears, equalize hundreds of times during the course of the day when we chew, swallow, yawn, all those things. When there's fluid in the middle ear, that air will move through that fluid. That's what makes that popping and crackling noise because it's passing through the fluid. Now, the more acute symptoms of middle ear barotrauma is, of course, more serious pain. They have a sense of true hearing loss, not just muffled, but it's like they really can't hear. They can also start to feel slightly off balance. And these are the folks that usually, if they spit after a dive, they've got some blood mixed in with their saliva. It can also be from their sinuses, but quite often, if it's just in their saliva, it's more likely because of middle ear barotrauma than anything else. With the sinus symptoms being mild, it's going to be pressure in the affected sinuses, again, lightheadedness or dizziness, and a localized headache, depending on which sinuses are being affected. The more acute symptoms, of course, is going to cause increased pain, forehead, cheeks, teeth, the occiput, which is the very back of the head, or behind the eyes. Dizziness can be more severe, and it can actually produce numbness again, like we talked about with the nerves being in the cheek, teeth, or the gum line. Usually the folks that have a sinus barotrauma, these are the folks that come up with the bloody nose. I'm sure at some time in your career you've had somebody, or even yourself, come up and had mask, mask full of blood. Can it be from the middle ear? Yes. More often, it's from the sinuses. So if they've got a bloody nose, please be aware of the possibility that they're having a sinus problem. So let's take a look at some of the things when we talk about difficulties. What is it that can make it a problem for divers to equalize? This is a report of chronic health problems from non-injured DAN members. This is in our 2008 report. You can see the common chronic health issues, number one, is allergies. Allergies cause inflammation, as any of you who suffer from allergies know, can cause mucus production, can cause those mucous membranes to become swollen and inflamed. And if you notice farther down on the list, some divers even show that they've had previous ear or sinus surgery. But the number one issue you see is allergies. The other medical issues, of course, trying to dive with active cold or allergy symptoms, certainly chronic allergy symptoms. It's important to work with the doctor to try to correct the symptoms. We'll talk a little more about that. There can be structural anomalies, such as a deviated septum. Now, the septum is the cartilage in the bone that runs up the very center of the nose, and that should be nice and straight. But from injuries or even just as a kind of a birth defect, if you will, that can be crooked. It can be bent to one side or another. That can make it difficult to equalize one side or the other. So this is something that can be corrected. If it's severe enough, you can have that corrected. You don't have to fear having that surgery done. Most divers, when they have surgery to correct that deviated septum, they find that their problems are resolved. Polyps are these benign little growths that can show up almost anywhere on mucous membranes. As you can imagine, it doesn't take much to interfere with air movement in and out of the sinuses or the middle ear. So if a doctor detects polyps, don't be afraid to have those removed. It's probably going to be in your best interest. Now there are some basic skills, especially when we talk about using techniques. We find that a lot of divers are simply not doing it right. They don't quite know what to experience. I know in my repertoire as an instructor, I was reminding students that they should feel or hear a pop or a click. And I was working with one student who seemed to be doing it right, but just wasn't quite sure. And I asked, are you feeling and hearing a pop or a click? And their reply to me was, no, I'm not hearing or feeling that. All I'm hearing is a 
So I realized I had to increase my repertoire. So that pop or click, they may not hear that. So they not always are sure of what they're supposed to experience. A little technique that you can use, and if you notice the name after that different method, is a Dr. Thomas Balcony. Now he is a very experienced ear, nose, and throat specialist, an avid diver, and as a matter of fact, he is a professor of otolaryngology at a leading medical school in South Florida. So this is somebody who does know a little something. So a technique that he was able to demonstrate to me that I want to explain to you is to get people not to focus on trying to make something happen in the middle ear. Because I'm sure you've seen your students that are pinching and blowing so hard you swear they're going to pop their eyes out of their head. They're actually working against themselves. When they're tightening up muscles like that, they're actually tightening the muscles down that help open the eustachian tubes. So they're working against themselves. Another method to use, and that Dr. Balcony recommended, is to get them not to focus on making anything happen in the middle ears. The easiest thing to do, and, and once I demonstrate this, I'd like you all to try it. The easiest thing to do is instead of pinching the nostril shut, is to simply take the thumb and the index finger and block the nostrils from underneath. What you ask them to do is to simply exhale through their nose enough to make their nostrils bulge or flare. You can even ask them to do this in front of a mirror. And that's at first all you want them to focus on is just making their nostrils flare or bulge. Once they're able to do that, if they continue to exhale through their nose, they will feel their middle ears equalize. At your convenience, go ahead and try that and see how easy that works. And as you can see, that's a great way to start with your problem children, if you were, to get them to understand what they're supposed to feel. Then it's simply an easy matter of them pushing on the bottom of the nose pocket to mimic that or eventually being able to pinch their nostrils closed. Another technique you can apply, regardless of whether they're swallowing or doing the pinch and blow, an adjunct to that is to simply have them move their lower jaw forward, kind of like that. I'm exaggerating, but just have them simply move their jaw forward. What that does is it actually pulls on the muscles that help open the eustachian tubes. So you can do that with whatever method they choose. I know when you read the list of all the other methods like the Toynbee and the Frenzel and all that, it gets almost too complicated to follow. So simply moving the jaw forward or having them block their nostrils is a good way to start. Cannot emphasize enough how important buoyancy control is, and that starts with proper weighting. Most new divers have a tendency to be an anchor. They're grossly overweighted, they're dropping too fast. That makes it hard for them to keep up with equalization. The other part is too, is we all know that if we feel discomfort or pressure on the ears, we have to stop and ascend a little bit until that goes away. If you don't have good buoyancy control, you can't do that. So buoyancy skills are absolutely integrated with proper equalization. And by the same token, another thing we have to remember as instructors is we don't, and I know I use this in my vocabulary, we would talk about our students feeling discomfort and certainly pain. They should never get to the point where they feel discomfort. We want to key in on them simply feeling increased pressure. That has a lot to do with how long they wait to equalize. If they're not feeling discomfort or pain, they think they're okay, but they're actually waiting too long to equalize. I've actually talked to divers who say, oh, normally I don't do any equalization until I'm at least 10 feet. They're already behind the process. Remember, in as little as eight feet of water, the eustachian tubes are clamping shut, which is going to make it harder to equalize. So every foot, every couple of feet, as soon as they start to feel pressure, that's the trigger to equalize. And if they've had previous ear squeeze or barotrauma, if that has not recovered completely, they're also at risk for this making problems worse. The mechanical issues that can affect how we equalize, 
It can be as simple as too much earwax. Now this is not necessarily about hygiene. There are some people that just seem to make more earwax than others. Most of the students that you find know that they have a problem with this because they've had help to remove that. It's important to remember if you look at the picture that that impacted cerumen can act the same as a plain old earplug. It can create a blind air passage that can't be equalized. So it can have that same effect. And wearing a hood, we all know that can make it more difficult to equalize, but have you ever thought about why that's a problem? As we're equalizing, the eardrum has to be able to move. And when we're not wearing a hood, that happens very easily because the ear canal is open to the surrounding water, plenty of place for the water to move. Now when you're wearing a hood that's tight up against the ears, you've now got a solid column of water and water is not compressible, so it has to be able to move. And if you've got that hood up against the ear canal, that water is not going to move. So that's why it becomes more difficult to equalize when you're wearing a hood. Divers, a lot of times, will just have them put an ear in there and pull the hood away to allow the water column to move. Or some divers will even go from the inside of their neoprene hood and cut a circle about where their ear canals are leaving the outer nylon intact. So they've got a hole on the inside of the hood that allows for that water movement. Now not everybody needs to do that, but that's one way that divers have found to combat that. So if you're one of those folks or you have a student that you know is in, that is likely to have that impacted cerumen in the ear, please do not encourage them to use the cotton swabs. All that's going to do and remember, nothing larger than your elbow in your ear. So that is actually going to push the earwax in farther and make it harder to get out. And you can damage the eardrum. The simplest thing to do is get a syringe like you see, a bulb syringe, and just keep flushing that ear with warm, soapy water. At most of the drugstores, there's even kits you can buy that will help that process. There's you know, solutions in these kits that will help soften the wax, make it easier to flush out. But please, if they know they've got a problem with that, that's one of the simplest things they can do to improve their equalization. If it's congestion from the leftovers from a cold, and certainly any of you, you know, dive instructors that work in warm Caribbean areas, you know in the winter months you'll have divers come down from up north that are getting over a cold that want to dive right away. Well, it may be worth asking them to wait or if they still have some congestion, you can flush out that nasopharynx with the neti pots or something equivalent. You want to clear all that congestion out because remember, that affects your ability to equalize the ears and the sinuses. So making sure that's clear is absolutely fine. But it's not medication, so it doesn't affect the mucous membranes, but it does mechanically clear the congestion out of the way. Divers that seem to have continual problems you can ask them to repeatedly and again gently equalize on their way to the dive site, either on the boat or certainly in the car ride. Just have them gently equalize and then move and do that a number of times. We all know we should stretch before we exercise. The same thing with equalization. You're kind of warming everything up. And there's some controversy about whether you should equalize before you descend some experts claim that it really doesn't do any good. Others swear that it does. It's not going to do them any harm to try it. And it also, too, will help detect if they're having any problems. And certainly, you want to descend feet first because that simply means that air is going to travel up, which is easier than trying to move in any other direction. If you have divers that have one ear that's consistently more of a problem than the other, what you can ask them to do is tilt their head. Let's say it's their left ear. They can tilt their head to put that left ear more towards the surface. If you look at the drawing that's on the slide, you can see that the eustachian tube is now almost straight up and down. Air will follow in a vertical position much easier than a more horizontal position. So that head tilt can actually help, but it's if, if it's one ear more than the other or they can alternate if it happens to be both ears. But that head tilt just gives the air a much straighter path to follow. That can make a difference. 
So let's talk about medications. We know that over-the-counter medicines, it's controversial. There's definitely some you know, controversy about whether you should use them or not. All the over-the-counter decongestants are designed to be used for short term. If you read the labels on the boxes, they will tell you that usually no more than three to five days. So you do have to keep that in mind. And that's a very good recommendation because using it far too often, it begins to lose its effectiveness where it doesn't work for you as much as it should. The effectiveness is limited by time. Most of them last four to six hours. That's the danger with diving is that it can wear off. Consider using the long-acting or the 12-hour formula. That's going to make sure that it's less likely to wear off while you're diving. And remember, the over-the-counter medicines are treating the symptoms. They're not treating the underlying condition, but they do effectively treat the symptoms. Prescription medications are much less problematic. You can use them over a longer period of time. The drawback to those is that you have to use some of them especially the nasal steroids, you have to use those starting a week or more before you're going diving to make sure they reach their maximum effectiveness. The prescription medicines or even the ones that were formerly prescription that you can now get over the counter, they are much better at addressing the underlying condition. Folks that have chronic allergies, these are the medicines that work more on the allergy rather than just the symptoms. None of the medications that are prescription are known or suspected to be problematic with diving. And we've even found that the over-the-counter decongestants that have been reputedly been a problem were found out through research that they're not anywhere near the problem that it was once believed. So what are the classes of medicines that you can use that are over-the-counter? The primary ones, of course, are the decongestants. Now, how they work is that they constrict the blood vessels in the mucous membranes. That's how they work. They constrict those blood vessels. This is also what happens with what's known as that rebound effect. That four or six hours that it's effective, it's constricting the blood vessels so the mucous membranes will actually shrink so they're not as inflamed. When that wears off, those blood vessels will now return to normal and sometimes it will actually swell greater than what they were before. That's that rebound effect. Now you've got more swelling than what was there before, which can make it more difficult to equalize and it can set you up for that reverse block. It does also reduce mucus production and the vasoconstrictors are not appropriate for all patients. You want to make sure that it's okay to use with your health history. Folks that have a history of cardiac problems, high blood pressure, and men, even if you've had problems with prostate, you really shouldn't take the vasoconstrictor decongestants. They can be problematic. Now, the over-the-counter antihistamines, histamine is, an, is what's released by the body when it's experiencing an allergen. The antihistamines block that production. It helps prevent the swelling, inflammation, mucus production. They are very good at preventing or reducing the allergy symptoms because they're blocking the histamine. The biggest problem with the antihistamines is the most common side effect is drowsiness. They can make you very sleepy. And yes, just so you know, the over-the-counter medicines that are used to treat motion sickness are also antihistamines. So be aware, if you can still function, you're fully alert, and it doesn't seem to make you drowsy, that may be appropriate for you. Use them very prudently and be very observant of the cautions that come with it. You want to use them as directed and don't overuse them. If you find yourself having to use them more and more frequently, it's time to see a good doctor who understands how to manage allergies. That in the long run is going to do more good than anything else. So the eardrops, we need to talk about what eardrops actually do. Now, whether it's the commercially made drops like Swimmer's Ear, Oro Dry, or the drops that divers make themselves that are equal parts of alcohol and vinegar, what these are intended to do is to prevent Swimmer's Ear infection, or as it's also known, 
otitis externa. This is an infection in that outer ear canal. All those drops are designed to do is to try to prevent that type of infection. These are not multi-purpose drops. We know too many divers and too many instructors even who when the student comes up and complains of an ear problem, the first thing they want to do is put eardrops in there. Please don't do that, especially if they're complaining of pain. The reason why is that it's one, it's not going to do them much good. If you remember, we talked about fluid being on the inside of the eardrum. So putting drops in the outer part of the ear is not going to help. It may not do any harm, but it's certainly not going to help. The other problem, especially if they're complaining of pain, is they may have a hole through their eardrum. And if you've ever accidentally gotten any alcohol or something similar on a fresh cut or scrape, you know how much that hurts. That's another downside. If they're complaining of pain, please don't put any alcohol in their ears because it's going to hurt a lot. The other problem is too is if you've got a hole through the eardrum and you put the drops in there that are much cooler than body temperature, you can cause these people to have at least temporarily severe vertigo, that spinning sensation, even to the point where they're feeling nauseated and may even vomit. So unless you're trying to prevent the swimmer's ear, please don't put the drops in their ear. And if they actively have an ear infection, that otitis externa, these drops will not treat that. That's when it's time to see a doctor who can give proper medication to make that work and heal that up. The vented plugs that are okay to use with diving or the special masks that have like the earmuffs on it, those are designed too to keep the ear canals as dry as possible. The intent behind those products is to keep that ear canal dry and help prevent swimmer's ear infection. Now, are there divers that report that those products do make it easier for them to equalize? Yes, there are. But there's probably as many or more divers who show, who report that there's no difference in equalization. They're not intended to improve equalization. None of the dive ENT specialists that we've consulted with have ever been able to understand or explain why the earplugs or the mask would help facilitate equalization. So it's kind of a roll of the dice. If somebody is prone to swimmer's ear and the drops don't work, certainly these are other products that may make it better for them. But nobody can tell you that it absolutely will improve equalization. But it's maybe worth a try. So don't, again, don't use the drops when the diver's reporting pain. If there's any kind of discharge or blood from the ear canal, please don't use it. And if they're complaining of that sensation of water in the ears, remember, it's not in the ear canal, it's on the inside of the eardrum. As far as field man management goes, always we encourage a medical evaluation because you may have a more serious problem than what you might think. If the person has symptoms of middle ear barotrauma or sinus barotrauma, please recommend that they delay diving because if it's not back to normal, they're setting themselves up for further injury. Always be cautious when suggesting medications because you have to be sure of what you're dealing with. What can seem like one problem could actually turn out to be something different. That's why having a doctor examine the person may be the best course. But if it seems pretty uncomplicated or pretty straightforward, you can talk about what may help them or not. Also, if they're having trouble equalizing, before you start with the medications, consider going over their techniques. How are they equalizing? Make sure that they've got good buoyancy control and that what their history, do they have any underlying medical issues? These are the important things to find out. Now, if you have a diver that surfaces with the following symptoms, please get them immediately for a medical evaluation. If they're complaining of acute pain, Discharge other than blood from the ears or sinuses, they should be seen right away. Certainly that true vertigo, nausea or vomiting, or balance problems. They need to be seen right away. The same thing if they're reporting a true hearing loss. Don't hesitate. These folks, no kidding, need help right away. So remember what the anatomy of the ear is and how the structures all work together. 
understanding what parts are involved is going to make it easier for you to offer tips to them. Be sure that you're aware of the most common signs and symptoms of those very common injuries so you know what pitfalls to avoid. Stop and think about why divers have difficulty. What is it that may be making it difficult for them to equalize? Rely first on helping them with better techniques, certainly buoyancy control, and their ear health. Let's start with the simple things first. Try those first. When it comes to medications, they should be prudent. If again they're taking it over long term, prescription medications are probably a better alternative. And an ear, nose, and throat doctor or an allergist does not have to know anything about diving in order to help control allergy symptoms or repair maybe a potential defect. Don't hesitate to encourage a medical evaluation even if they're having trouble, especially if they're having problems. And I'm sorry to say there is no magic bullet. We get asked quite often, what's the secret? What's the trick for me being able to equalize? I wish I could tell you that there was a magic bullet for that, but there isn't. There's just no one fix-em-all answer. And unfortunately for some individuals, no matter what efforts they put into it, no matter how many experts they see, they are just never able to equalize. And these are the folks that unfortunately may never be able to dive. So that is an unfortunate reality. Please keep these things all in mind. Don't, certainly don't hesitate to contact Dan if you've got any questions about it. But remembering these things will help us all do a better job and make diving safer and more enjoyable. Thank you for your time.